Hello, everybody. Wow, what an honor. Yeah, I'm sure this situation looks really familiar to a lot of you out there. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're addicted to your phone, too. It's completely rewired your daily routine. And just try and picture what would happen if you lost your phone at lunch today. <laughs> right? You're not alone, though. Do a Google search on the topic. You're going to find dozens of stats and perspectives on how it's changing life. Things like we care more about our phones than our toothbrushes. Or we look at our phones more often on a daily basis than our loved ones. I think about this stuff a lot in my day job. Uh, basically, I help brand executives, a lot of the retailers you probably shop with, figure out exactly what they're going to do now that we as consumers can't make a single decision without consulting our screens first. Having done more of these strategy sessions than I'd like to admit, I've developed a really good understanding for why we fall in love with these devices so quickly. They're integrated, they're intuitive, they're always around, and they know us. This isn't just a US thing, though. It's happening everywhere. From Latin America to Asia Pacific, globally, we're benefiting from this innovation. I have a special connection to Sub-Saharan Africa. Half of me is from a country on the western coast called Cameroon. And my family and I really canvassed the region when I was a kid due to my father's work for the United Nations. For those of you who aren't familiar with the area, let me just paint you a high-level picture. So this is a space that's projected to be a billion strong in population by the end of the decade. It's spread out over close to 50 countries, so there's this beautiful variety of cultural perspectives, languages, etc. One of the biggest problems that it has is it's an area that it's almost completely devoid of any of the societal infrastructure that we here are used to. So for all of recent history, there's been this severe lack of schools, hospitals, I would argue most importantly, energy access. Only a quarter of these individuals are going to have working electricity this year. But that is the baseline. Think of how low the usage is for computers, landline phones, or even televisions. Just to scale this for you a little bit more, this is a region that has the same amount of uh, power consumption as Spain, while having 18 times the people. I remember when I was a kid, the effort my dad would put into this work, fighting to let this region be at the very least self-sustaining. Still does to this day, going into his 70s, still working. Going from region to region, running into roadblock after roadblock, you have to imagine how demoralizing that can be. Around 1995, my family spent some time in Brazzaville, which is a city in the Republic of the Congo. Um, it was at a time when Brazzaville was at the epicenter of a political coup d'etat, which is essentially just an effort to overthrow the government. My father was consulting on an election that happened right before then, and it got so hostile that my family and I had to evacuate immediately one evening. We threw what essentials we could into a bag, move back to the United States to start over. Side note, advice for the parents out there, never let an adolescent boy pack their own essentials bags. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my brother are throwing Game Boys action figures, baked goods, um, certainly not essentials, let's say that. But I remember a little bit later, my mom taking a call after officials had gone back and surveyed the damage in our house. And one of the most striking things she took away was that people had ripped the toilet seats and the sinks out the wall. That's how dire the infrastructure challenges were 15, 20 years ago. Needless to say, it isn't the easiest place in the world to make civil progress. One well-respected editorial went as far as to label this region close to a billion people hopeless. 2,000. But I want to be really clear. I'm not here to tell you this sad story. I'm not asking for your charity at all. I know our brains are wired to feel this sympathy, but what I really want to talk to you about is innovation. Because in the time since then, that exact same editorial is now coining this space as the hottest frontier in investing, an awakening giant, and hopeful. 15 years. It's an absolutely incredible comeback story. The driving force behind this is that in that same time frame, Sub-Saharan Africa is now the fastest growing and second largest mobile phone market in the world. And it's creating an entirely new plane for its citizens to build on top of.
Mobile phone penetration has already lapped electricity access. And by the end of the decade, it's projected that over 500 million Africans will have a phone on them, easily outpacing Europe and North America. It's also important to note that the region now boasts the fastest growing middle class in the world and has five of the top 10 fastest growing economies. With the majority of this population still under 30, one bank called this movement unstoppable. I really like the thought process that the president of Guinea, Alpha Conde, had at the most recent World Economic Summit. This is a quote from one of his sessions. The speed of change in innovation offers a prospect of confronting our biggest problems more quickly and efficiently than we would have ever done before. There's all this innovation being bred out of necessity. Mobile phones has given an entire region that, as you've seen, has been on life support the ability to leapfrog the barriers that they've faced in the past and finally make some real progress. It's hard for us to even visualize, right? I mean, mobile phones have changed our lives, mostly for the better, but you could argue a lot of the innovation that we're seeing is cosmetic. We have these new and immersive ways to socialize with our friends. I can press a button and get a car to come pick me up at any time in any place in this country and we're right at the cusp of letting mobile phones be the remote control of our houses with connected appliances. I'd ask you though, how much of this do we need? How much of this is gonna shape the roots of our already established communities? For them, that basic necessity allows them to open the aperture for how they use this device. And it's created an entirely clean slate for them to design their future on. This is going to change everything, but I want to talk to you about three of the most impactful ways that I feel like they're applying this energy in the education, healthcare, and financial spaces. So first and foremost, education is a real problem in the region. Two in three children will not move past grade school this year, 80% of females, mainly because there's a severe lack of teachers. These kids aren't stupid. They're not incapable of learning. But one estimate pointed to us needing 350,000 new educators to solve for the teaching gap. It also doesn't help that the region struggles with the highest concentration of illiterate adults in the world. That resource drought makes a classroom-only based education system almost impossible to execute well. But there's this new group of startups that's trailblazing in this space, letting kids learn, work, read all from their phones. In South Africa, the Yoza Project set out to allow children to download all different types of reading material, from lectures to novels, directly to their phones. It doesn't seem like a lot, but for a kid who's maybe only seen a handful of books her entire life, you can imagine how enlightening that is. In the first 18 months, they, sat out, they saw over a half a million completed reads. Stereo Me a platform that encourages students and teachers to use messaging to collaborate on homework problems and see lesson plans. They ran into funding issues last year, but really paved the way for so many other startups to start building in this mobile learning space. Now that phones are the first and only point for information, this region is embracing them, and they're finally starting to reach children at scale. Soon enough, we're going to be able to teach the youth in Sub-Saharan Africa more efficiently and more effectively than any classroom-only based education model ever could. The straits are a lot more dire in the healthcare space. While only having 2% of the world's doctors, the region struggles with 25% of the global disease burden. That ratio makes a scaled approach absolutely essential. We just don't have enough doctors. Even if a family's lucky and they do get health care, the workers have to travel long distances, work under terrible conditions, all while getting no data to support their efforts. My family has a foundation in rural Cameroon, which um, one of the major health care pillars being what we call le journée médicale. Essentially, twice a year, we'll pool doctors together to head out to rural Cameroon and provide medical relief for everything from headaches to ultrasounds. In the first couple years of running this, over 25,000 cases have been treated. Can you imagine how good it must feel for these families to finally be able to tell somebody about their problems? 
There's certainly a need, but as I mentioned, it happens biannually. In the interim, it's been almost impossible to keep any progress or momentum going. Not being able to push out information or obtain good quality data has been a major, major problem. I'm not saying we're going to solve everything right away, but mobile phones are creating this large-scale, cost-efficient sensor network that rivals any data source we've ever had in the region in the past. It's becoming essential in the fight against disease outbreaks. Take malaria. Parasite transferred by mosquitoes burrows itself into your liver, multiplies thousands and thousands of times, and enters your bloodstream. It's going to kill 2,000 people today. Being a child that had malaria, I can tell you this is no joke. One of the primary solutions is to get more and more families to adopt the use of mosquito nets during critical outbreaks. But with the la limited communication reach, you can imagine how difficult that's been. Try and picture a hurricane bearing down on Nashville with no way to proactively warn anybody about it. The nonprofit Malaria No More actually pivoted towards mobile phones to spread this awareness during critical times and track adoption. Early results in Cameroon showed a double-digit percentage increase in usage amongst children. Researchers are using a similar type of data set to understand human travel patterns in Kenya. That way they can identify these red flag parasite areas during outbreaks and develop optimal travel routes eventually to reduce contagion. There's even proactive innovation that's happening. In Nigeria, this startup Nixit developed a health mobile app that provides families with first aid topics, nutritional information, even possible illnesses with a symptom checker. For all intents and purposes, a virtual physician, because we can't get a physical doctor there. It's going to be more advanced use cases coming out soon, trust me, but as the head of Malaria No More recently said, good information is how we're going to save lives. For the first time, we're able to obtain good quality data and communicate at scale with mobile phones. That in itself is going to save millions in the next five years. Lastly, I'd argue that there hasn't been a space more impacted than the financial sector. Try and picture a month of your life where you only use cash. Think of all the business models that just wouldn't be around anymore. The limited groundwork for banking in the area has stifled Sub-Saharan Africa's economic growth. It's funny how fast things change, though, because mobile phones, and more specifically mobile money services, is giving all of these individuals a new chance at capitalism. Sub-Saharan Africa now accounts for over half of all of the mobile money services in the world right now. Just to give you more context on this, Kenya is an early adopter in this space. The amount of funds that they see flowing through mobile payments is equal to about 50% of their GDP. In North America, we're around 4%. There's startups all over the, the space that are moving this innovation forward as well. The one you may have heard of most is M-Pesa. 60 Minutes did a segment on them last year, enabling individuals to pay bills, deposit earnings, transfer funds, all from their phone. They have close to 20 million active users right now. In Nigeria, a similar innovation sprung up in Paga, which in its first full year of operation saw close to 900% year-over-year growth. What's maybe more exciting is all of these platforms are giving other startups the ability to build on top of them. So we're seeing innovation in Kenya where families can buy credits to redeem at clean water pumps in the area from their phones. Or in South Africa, where schools allow parents and students to pay their tuition through mobile payments. For almost everybody over there, this increased access is transforming their financial independence. The ability to start a business, open a savings account, even take on affordable credit through your mobile phone is playing a huge role in the reduction of poverty and the sudden increase that we're seeing in their middle class. So what am I up here actually telling you what to do? Um, so I know I said this wasn't going to be a charity conversation, but please humor me for 30 seconds. I'm sure most of you don't just have one phone. I'm sure you have another two or three sitting in your drawers at home. Some of my colleagues have copped to having upwards of 14 spare phones. What do you need 14 phones for? 
right? Based on what I just showed you, outside of the basic necessities, food, shelter, water, equipping a child in Sub-Saharan Africa with a mobile phone is the most empowering thing that you can do for them. There's plenty of organizations, Hope Phones being one of them, where you can donate your old phones to be refurbished and used in a developing nation. Global estimates put the sweet spot at affording a phone over there between $25 and $50. We're just starting to get close to that right now, but there's still millions and millions of Africans who can't afford these phones at the current price. More importantly, though, this is something that we all need to be paying attention to. Some of the most transformational innovation in the world for mobile phones will be soon coming out of this nation, as it has in the past in Asia-Pacific markets like India. I'm fortunate enough to work at a company that's realizing this. Earlier this week, in partnership with Digify, Google just pledged to educate a million sub-Saharan African youth on digital skills, ranging from a three-month intensive training session all the way down to an online learning platform, mobile optimized, obviously. I always go back to that original statement from President Conde that necessity breeds innovation. You could apply that to anything or anyone. I see it in the same vein that we're now seeing all of these beautiful and interesting startups being born in dorm rooms, parents' basements, garages. Because our communities do not need these applications, it makes it almost impossible for us to comprehend. But Sub-Saharan Africa, they are that kid in their parents' basement. They're that kid thinking of new and innovative ways to apply technology because they have to. So what I'm really asking is for you all to put your phones down for 10 minutes and look around, because this, this is a revolution we'll be talking about in 50 years. How an entirely forgotten region of a billion people was able to bring itself back into this global conversation by using the only piece of technology that they had access to. A device we were all carrying around in our pockets. Extremely humbled to be here. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>